opening filmmaker of the film Free Solo, which you certainly have seen. It's no surprise that we're talking about Mr. Jimmy Chin. He's also a National Geographic photographer and a well-known mountain sport at sports athlete known for his ability to capture extraordinary imagery while climbing, skiing in the highest risk environments in the world. He began his professional career uh, pre-2000 and his talents were quickly recognized by the top folks in the world. I remember uh, very early on in my photographic journey seeing some of the, the climbing photographs that Jimmy had started to shoot and uh, been so impressed. We've been in the same circles for years, um, lots of mutual friends, and so that's going to allow us to go extra deep today. And if you're tuning in right now from uh, Facebook or YouTube, might be a good chance to head over to creativelive.com slash TV, where I'm looking at um, a live feed of comments coming in from all over the world. You can click the join live chat right there, and I will see your comments and questions, and we'll uh, do everything I can to work them into my conversation with Jimmy. But without further ado, the man that you are here to see, um, Mr. Jimmy Chin in the house. Jimmy, welcome to the show, bud. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Good. Where are you coming in live from today, my man? I'm coming in live from my home in Jackson, Wyoming. Yeah. And and uh, before I confess, before we were live, you were uh, commenting about a ski. You just got to uh, ski a big line yesterday. Is that right? Can you give us the uh, what it's what line you skied and or what it's like to be skiing right now uh, in, in, in COVID when most people are locked in small apartments around the world? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've been throughout this whole kind of quarantine, uh, you know, we've been doing, you know, getting out, being in the back country, but obviously keeping it really mellow because we didn't want to stress the already stressed um, healthcare system. So, uh, but, you know, just pretty much in my backyard. <laughs> He's just pointing at it. It's like, it's right there. <laughs> I'm not in, in the park, but south of the park, uh, and skiing up around um, some of the southern Tetons. Um, it's been really, been very grateful um, that, you know, we're in a place where we have an opportunity to kind of stay outside and be outside and get some fresh air and exercise. And um, I think as they say in Wyoming, we've been Residents of Wyoming have been social distancing since the inception of the state. <laughs> <laughs> well said, yeah. For so many people uh, who are, again, locked in small apartments all around the world, we've got folks coming in from London, from South Africa. I see an Australia. I see an Oslo, a Copenhagen. Um, so, wow. yeah, so that we have people joining in from all over the world is not an overstatement. And I'm sure a lot of those folks are locked in small apartments somewhere. So, um, thank you for living your best life in Wyoming, and uh, we'll live vicariously through you. I also have a chance to be outside here. I'm on the Puget Sound. I'm going to go for a paddle here shortly. Uh, one of the few opportunities to uh, to be outside in 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 you know a place for me. Uh, I've been in the family for about a hundred years. This little chunk of property. I'm trying to do the same thing. You know, work when I can, and uh, and remotely. But your work is entirely different than most people's work because your work is basically remote by nature and yet integrating uh, a lot of equipment, a lot of other people making films and whatnot. But before we get into like more about what you're doing right now, I want to go back for those folks who are new to your world. Uh, I, I'm guessing they'd have to be living under a rock because damn near everybody I know on the whole planet has seen Free Solo. Um, but most people don't know your backstory from uh, in, in the world that we're talking to. Mostly creators and entrepreneurs tuning in today. So familiar with the the profession that you set out at, but not the climbing part. They understand the, the photography and the filmmaking. Um, so I'm looking to build a little bit of a narrative arc. Let's go back to, um, you know, early days. How did you find this sort of the passion that you have right now for being outside? And how did you combine that with um, with filmmaking to make a not just a a life but a living as well yeah well kind of ironically like i grew up in the midwest in like a small town called mankato minnesota in like south central minnesota which is basically one of the flattest places in the united states <laughs> um it's certainly not like a, hot, a hotbed of you know 
climbers or high altitude alpinists or really photographers or filmmakers. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, my, my parents were from China, Chinese immigrants, and they were librarians at the university there. And I guess, you know, I've been asked this a bit, but I, I, I really think it's because I was fed a ton of books growing up. I had an older sister who read voraciously. So I was always, and she was six years older than me. So I was always kind of like picking up the books that she had been reading and and um, was reading pretty advanced levels like at a young age. And I think that really kind of um, expanded my imagination. Uh, and, you know, I grew up doing a lot of different activities, sports, um, I started playing the violin when I was three and a half and swam competitively and studied the martial arts um, and was pretty competitive. Uh, my parents really stressed excellence and, you know, kind of traditional Chinese parents were like all about academics and getting into the right schools and stuff. And so I had that kind of like pounded into me um kind of those that ethos of hard work and trying really hard and you know being in kind of competitive sports um but i they weren't really my things you know they were kind of imposed on me and while like i've been more and more appreciative as i've grown older for like what those activities gave me Mm -hmm. younger I was like I want to go I all I wanted to do is play outside and uh I found skiing pretty early on um and that became my thing so I only got to do it if I was you know doing well in school and everything else and it, it actually motivated me to do really well so that I could ski as much as possible on this teeny hill behind my house um and I guess for so long, I just wanted to like escape my little hometown in the Midwest and explore the world. And, uh, and I found climbing when I was in college. Um, and between climbing and skiing, all I wanted to do is be in the mountains. Um, and that's kind of the path that I chose is I, I finished school, uh, and I moved to Yosemite and just went for it. I was like, this is what I want to do. This is what I love. And, and that was actually a really, really hard choice for me because, you know, I had a lot of pressure, certainly from my parents and my family, but I think also in society, you know, you're supposed to finish school and then you're supposed to get your internship or get your first job and start your career path. Um, and I was, you know, living in the back of my car or in a cave behind Camp 4, really questioning if that was the right decision, you know. Um, but that's that's the path that I chose. Well, at, what po at what point, so, you know, it sounds like you, you ran to climbing rather than ran to photography. And so at what point did you start to put those two things together? Because I, I, I definitely want to circle back. I, I have written extensively about this, and I think you and I have a shared value around understanding what society wants for you. And then there's the things that you actually have to do that you're put on this planet and finding out about it. I want to go back to that. But before, like you just talked about climbing and where did the where did the uh, the art part of your living and life come into the picture? I mean, it, it followed pretty quickly after I started spending time in Yosemite. Um, maybe within that year that I moved there, um, maybe two years after I kind of really committed to climbing, I picked up a camera from a good friend of mine who was uh, still a very close friend of mine, Brady Robinson. He's I'm now the executive director at the Conservation Alliance. But, you know, he showed me how to use his camera and it was like a manual. <laughs> Actually, he sent it to me. Um, Grab was, it. Can you see it? Yeah, it's right here. <laughs> nice. Check it out. 
check out the analog. Right yes. <laughs> an old Nikon. Is it um, an F2 or an F, F, FE, F, F, FE3? FE3, there you go. Um, but he uh, he showed me how to use it, and I, I took a photo with it um, one morning, and uh, he was trying to sell his photos. We were shooting on slides, and um, a company bought one photo from him, and it was the photo that I took. And they paid five hundred dollars for this photo which you know when you're living out of your car and i was actually teaching at Knowles at the time um as well just and odd jobs waiting tables i was doing whatever i could to kind of feed the um the passion but uh i took that money and i bought a camera and i just remember thinking that was like an outrageous amount of money for a photo i was like they paid that much money for a photo <laughs> and of course you know like the, I joke about this but at the time I was like wow I only need to take one photo a month and I'll be able to live like this for the rest of my life and I'm like living the dream <laughs> <laughs> it's so. amazing that that, that you start, share that story I sold my photo for 500 bucks but I also it was 500 bucks and a pair of heart skis you remember those skis oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, also a Minnesota company I think yeah. Um, 500. And I had the same exact thought, like, wait a minute. So 500 bucks, all I have to do is just do that again. And then again, and then I can just live here and I was living in steamboat at the time. And I could just live here and do that over and over again. This is, this is a good life. Yeah. And so clearly that's, that's changed for you. Um, so if that was the first, um, the first break, if you will, presumably others came, um, but did you, did you feel like, let's go back to that thing that I said we were going to go back to earlier, this idea of, you know, you were raised in a family where expectations were high, that you were going to perform and check a lot of the culturally accepted boxes. Um, and I think for so many people watching, just as a reminder, now we've got people tuned in also from Monica, from Dubai. Um, I know we got a fellow Minnesotan in the house, um, nice. India, Washington, D.C., um, lots of folks, but I'm guessing a lot of those people um, have been told stories from their parents and, and career counselors and mentors and friends and spouses about what they ought to be and become either when they grow up or that they better get their act together. And my assumption is that coming from a family where high performance was well regarded and academics were stressed, that this put some stress on the relationship with your parents and the relationship we'll just say with the world. So since so many people have the same problem, uh, this challenge, um, how did you deal with it? And, um, was it easy, hard, just give us a little bit of a blow by blow. Yeah. I mean, I think when I think of like, my story and especially in, in the beginning, like that choice, in my early 20s to follow my heart and my passion was certainly the most pivotal decision I ever made in my life, hands down. And those kinds of decisions are never easy. Um, I think that there was or is sometimes a misperception that I always knew what I wanted to do and it was really clear and I just did it and um, it kind of all fell into place, which to a degree is true, but the thing that I think is um, misunderstood is that that choice was filled with so much doubt and it wasn't like feeling doubt and dread for a couple months. It was like years of doubt. Um, and also feeling really guilty in a way like I'd let down my parents and that you know, because I did have a lot of friends that did follow a fairly traditional career path, have done really well, are very happy, but it wasn't, it, it, it didn't fit for me. And so whenever you feel like, oh, I'm not fitting in, that, 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 that's hard, you know. Um, and people often ask me, you know, like, what's the greatest risk you've ever taken? And, you know, I think the assumption is like climbing this mountain or skiing that mountain. But easily it was kind of t 
taking the leap and um, and moving to you know Yosemite and, and living in a car, which you know my parents' viewpoint was like <laughs> the ultimate failure um, in the sense like I you know because I would like I. I would call my sister and check in with her and be like, well, how are mom and dad doing? Kind of getting the lowdown for my sister, who, by the way, you know, went to Stanford, went to Oxford, was at Yale. You know, I mean, she checked a lot of them yeah. <laughs> for me. <laughs> She's brilliant. Um, and she was always super encouraging. She was like, you know what? You got to do what you, you, you're doing right now. It's the right thing. But she'd say, and I go, oh, how's mom doing? And she'd say, well, mom keeps saying under her, bre- under her breath that she's raised a homeless man. Um, and that was kind of like the, the their perspective. You know, they were like, he 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 got lost along the way. We did everything we could for him, um, and it was it was I think it was really hard on my parents, um, which was made it hard on me. And I can imagine now, like if my kids, you know, like I would call my parents and be like, "Well, I'm leaving for Pakistan, and I'm climbing high altitude walls for the next three months." And that, you know, we didn't have a sat phone or anything. And so it was like, I, I'll send a postcard when I get to Islamabad and, you know, I'll see you in three months, you know? Um, I mean, it'd be hard, I think, for any parent. For sure. Well, let's, let's, um, less about your parents and more about you. What, what was the, like, what was your headspace? Did you feel undeniably you were doing the right thing you talked about it as the hardest thing you've ever done did you what would and you talked about doubt did you ever think about throwing in the towel or once you started on this path um, yeah I, I did think I was gonna throw in the towel because originally I had said hey I'm gonna do this for a year climb and ski full time and then I'm gonna follow a career path and after that year I actually Went to San Francisco, was couch surfing at a friend's place, um, trying to do interviews. And I did a bunch of interviews. Um, and for, you know, like uh, environmental NGOs, I'd studied um, international relations and um, a big part of it was on international law and environmental studies. Uh, so I was kind of toying with this idea of doing, and I did a bunch of interviews and then, um, and then actually a friend of mine from Mammoth called me and was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I have interviews. I have an interview tomorrow. And he's like, you gotta come out to Mammoth now. There's storms lined up from, <laughs> you're about to hit the California coast. What are you doing? You're an idiot. And I was like, no, no I can't, I can't go to Mammoth. He's, and then um, the next day I packed up my car and drove to Mammoth. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> I never looked back and it was like the winter of 97 or something. I mean, it was 395 had closed down and it was, it just nuked. It was an El Nino year. It just nuked all day, every day for like three months straight or four months straight. And I just skied pow and lived in my friends. My friend was caretaking a house and there was a boiler room in the basement and I was sleeping on a sleeping pad in a boiler room in his basement and just skiing every day. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I but I, I still struggled. I, I, but the joy I was feeling. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, they were, it was, it was such a, deep, profound experience that I still seek and live for every day. And, and it's that feeling of being in the mountains and that self-reliance and that ex- exploration and adventure um, and the friendships, you know. Was that, yeah, ultimately, how did you reconcile this with your parents? Because again, I think doing the thing that you're compelled to do is, you know, we 
can understand why we would do that. And, and yet there's still this moment where, um, most people that I know who have taken a non-traditional path there, if it's not a moment, then it's a, a lifetime of small moments of reconciling with the people who, when you struck out on your own, didn't understand. Yeah. And I remember for me, my parents, it's, you know, finally when it was like, Oh, uh, yeah. Do you want to, um, where, where I was able to fly them around like, Oh, you want to come, you know, we're wrapping up in Switzerland. Do you want to come join us at the end of the shoot when they start to understand that? Okay. Cause you tell them $500 in a pair of skis and they think it's cute. Yeah. And presumably it's some, you know, it's, Oh, neat. That's great. And, but presumably at some uh-huh. point, yeah, you have to have a conversation with them. And is this, was this one moment or was it a thousand tiny moments? Because the people who are listening again from, from all over the world right now, most of these people haven't yet had the conversations with the people in their lives that they love. Yeah. And so I'm looking for you to help us uh, understand this a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I would say it, it was really hard, hard enough for a couple of years where my communication with them really dropped off, like probably two years. Um, and, but I was also really focused in some ways it was really meaningful and motivating because I was like, I had a lot to prove all of a sudden too. Yeah. You know? Um, and sometimes that's healthy. Sometimes that's not healthy. Um, I don't really see a therapist, so I don't know, but I, you know, that's part of the struggle, you know, where, um, you're also questioning, okay, well, what are my motivations and where are they coming from? And what are my intentions? I mean, those are really important questions to ask yourself all the time, right? Um, And those are the questions I was asking myself, a lot of existential questions. Um, You know, what is my purpose on this planet? Those kind of things. Um, But I found the relief in the act of climbing and in the act of being in the mountains and then in the act of shooting and photographing and starting to tell stories. And, and I got really, really focused on, you know, doing things every single day that I felt like were like moving me forward in some way, um, towards kind of a not totally clear goal, but I just was, it was about bettering myself all the time in everything that I did. And I did understand that like, I wanted to be the best version of myself in everything that I could, that I was doing. Um, and so that, that kept me really motivated. And so I started, finally, I started publishing pretty early on. Um, and I think that, you know, when my parents started seeing, I was publishing, that was one thing they didn't love the idea that I was going on these like massive expeditions to very remote places that seemed you know, they used to say to me, like, well, of course, we're really, really worried because there's not even a word in Chinese for what you do. Like, <laughs> you have a thousand year old written history and there isn't even a word for what you do in Chinese. So we need something to tell our friends. <laughs> yeah, well, and also, like, you have to, like, you know, give us a little a break here because it's just like so far out of our realm of reality. Um, and, and I, and then, you know, that I took that into account, but when I started publishing and then I think ultimately when there was, um, in 2002, uh, or 2003, when I got published in national geographic and we were at the headquarters and there was this, the whole lobby was dedicated to this expedition I'd done with. Conrad, Anchor, Rick Ridgway, and Galen Rowell to Tibet. And we were giving a talk at the um, Grosvenor Auditorium. And and I remember walking in with the lobby with my mom and her looking around. Um, and I think that that was a big moment. That was a big moment. And then I, you know, I, I gave a talk to a packed auditorium with Conrad and Rick. And, uh, and then we all went out for dinner afterwards. And, and I think that was a, that was a moment, you know, is it fair to say then that you just had to, um, cultivate what would 
be traditionally seen as success in order to get the haters or the people who were unsure or unclear and I'm expanding it beyond your parents here because I'm sure your parents aren't haters but yeah. for to, like you know um external validation is that one of the things that you felt have helped tip that and so folks would stop asking questions I mean that was never the focus of like getting that external validation outside of like I, in some ways I'd kind of written off my parents for a while you know you're in your early 20s that's what you do <laughs> and who doesn't write off their parents in their early 20s right? like they have no clue what's going on and I'm just gonna do this thing and it was that total commitment and I'm sure you've heard this many times from the people you've had on your show and, and friends but I was committed completely to um, the craft of each of the things that I was doing, whether that was climbing, um, a big part of it was also just like putting together expeditions. That's a, a craft, you know, you have to have like a vision, you have to have an idea, you have to be like hugely motivated to go do something that doesn't really pay you any money. And I mean, some of it's for the glory, but some of it's really just about being like really inspired when you see some mountain that is in this remote range and it's never been climbed and you see a beautiful lion on it. And I don't know why, but that can be like hugely motivating. Um, and so there was that kind of just deep commitment into doing what I was doing and um, actually not looking for external validation and and climbing is kind of an interesting especially when I like in the late 90s like there's an ethos around it everybody's trying to be understated and you're just trying to be you know you're trying to push yourself and and push it to the edge and see what you can achieve and I was really surrounded by a lot of people like that um, in Yosemite. And that's why I, I, you know, I always think of like the climbing tribe is still the closest community to my heart because those are the people that I, I fell in with and that, you know, just they're so motivated. And at the time, you know, climbing has become much more mainstream now, but like it was a lot of misfits and <laughs> just like, but extraordinary people um, that I felt like just had like a lot of human spirit and, and we're always kind of chasing the human potential. Um, and that's kind of like very much a theme in the work that I've done. Uh, there's, I, I love this, um, the way that you articulated, uh, focusing on the craft and keeping your head down and largely ignoring those voices, whether you're from your parents. And I think you, you attributed to being in your 20s, but I think that's a, a great piece of takeaway for anyone who's listening that you are going to have to ignore people. And often these people that are arguably some of the closest people that you have in the world who don't understand your vision, but this idea of and, and an ethos, I think is a great word, of allegiance to yourself and to your tribe of misfits um, that you've fallen in love with around whatever it is that you want to do. And it's to understand that that culture doesn't largely welcome those folks and whether it's external validation that ultimately um, helps them capitulate and start paying attention to you or, or something else. Um, I love that there's this a focus on the thing rather than on the, the things that are a focus on the thing and the craft rather than on what would arguably um, be distractions. So uh, if you're just now joining us, tuning in live from all over the world, I'm Chase and I'm sitting here with uh, my longtime friend, Jimmy Chin. Not only is he one of the top climbers in the world, but he's also a questions coming in from the world. I uh, will uh, ask a few of those in due time here. So if you have them, put them in the comments and I will see them and forward them to Jimmy. Um, but I do want to shift gears, Jimmy. That was a great, you know, sort of re um, un unpacking, if you will, of um, how you got from what I say zero to one, how you went from having a dream to living it. Now let's talk about going from one to 10. If 10 is winning an Oscar and um, 
one is just getting started. Talk to us about five when you're at like points four, five, and six in the middle and you're just grinding because I think that's a dark tunnel for a lot of people and that's where a lot of people shift and give in and and um, we'll celebrate at the end here. We'll talk about we'll talk about the Oscar and the Oscar parties, but uh, <laughs> talk to us about the grind for a little bit and what it takes to achieve the success that you've created for yourself in filmmaking and climbing. Yeah. I think it goes back to what we were talking about, um, really kind of shutting out the noise and staying really focused and committed to the craft. And for me, it wasn't just photography, it was also climbing and skiing. And um, like I was saying, like putting expeditions together. And, um, but, you know, I think between, I would say the grind is like, 10 years long, you know, from 26 to 36 or whatever. I mean, I mean, I'm still grinding these days. It's like a lot of work. <laughs> um, and you got to love the grind. I mean, you got to embrace yeah. the grind, first of all. Um, but it's interesting because I feel like expedition climbing, there were so many takeaways and maybe, you know, it's a nature versus nurture thing. I, I, I don't know, but like maybe I was built to do that, but um, hard expeditions are hard. <laughs> they, they, you have to character and resilience and lot. overcoming fear and stress and yeah, ism and and the lessons I feel like I learned from doing expeditions were really applicable to the work and the career because if you can think of you know as as a climber and and you can take the parallels from this if you want but especially a professional climber you're looking to do things that nobody's ever done before and oftentimes the objectives you're going for are seemingly impossible and maybe a lot of people have tried them and failed and you know it's 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 way off out here um and what you discover when you start doing a lot of expeditions is that occasionally when everything lines up and you put your head down and you um put one foot in front of the other and you know every obstacle you can imagine drops in front of you along your path towards this objective and you just take it all in and you chip away at it it's it's literally one step at a time occasionally you achieve it and it's kind of unbelievable and when 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 that has been reinforced over time and which it was for me that like these impossible objectives were actually possible just through you know it's not a big secret it's 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 called hard work <laughs> you know um and and being committed um but also being smart uh knowing when to cut your losses also to when to turn around. Um, but you discover that you can achieve these kind of extraordinary things, um, not by doing one extraordinary thing, but by like doing a lot of little things to get there. And that's basically the mentality I took to my work as a photographer and as a filmmaker. Um, I think you have to have that objective in mind and it has to be there and you have to be inspired by it, motivated by it. Um, it can also become really overwhelming if that's all you're looking towards. So it's a balance of like staying focused on what's in front of you, the next three feet, and then occasionally checking in with yourself. Like, is this still where I want to go? You know, um, cause that's also important. Uh, that's great. What role? So Molly Bend at, or Molly Bond asks. I know you're co close with Conrad, and he's scaled back some of his uh, efforts recently, or at some point. And and um, I'm going to take it out of just like your relationship with Conrad and put it into the role of community. Like, what role did community play in your motivation, inspiration, and your growth and development? Uh, the the climbing community. Or yeah, I'll just talk about the kind of the climbing community. And then there's all these concentric circles too, because then 
there's this, the photography community, there's the filmmaking community, there's writers that I've worked with, you know, there's a lot of different communities that start to overlap. Um, what I really appreciated about my work that I'm the most grateful for um, have been the people that I've been able to work with and climb with and collaborate with. Uh, I think the most important part of being in these communities for me that was really pivotal were the people that kind of came out of those communities who kind of took me under their wing and, and recognized kind of my work ethic um, and you know really gave me big opportunities um, which I took. I think it's important Part of the conversation when it comes to mentorship though is that i always say that you don't necessarily find your mentors they find you and it, that's become much more clear to me now because being a mentor is a is a huge investment um and you want to invest in people that you feel like are um committed and have paid their dues in a certain way um and have showed kind of um their commitment to what they're doing and and their love and passion for it and that their intentions are all in the right place. Um, but w those are really important things. Um, but the community for me has has played a huge role in my career for sure. Um, not to jump ahead, but I, I do know that the overwhelming feeling I had at the Oscars, and I don't know why, well, I do know why, because it's, it is what it is, but like, it was, it's like my life flashed in front of my eyes and it was all of the people that helped me along the way to get me there because you don't get to a place like that by yourself. Like I've had so many incredible mentors and people in my life that have um, really, you know, helped guide me or push me along or that I aspired to, you know, um, and uh, so I hope that is the question. No, no, yeah, it, it, I think it's, um, I, I don't, I believe that the most misunderstood thing in culture is largely community. We're social animals, first of all. So we, whether we are introverts or extroverts, or we like spending, you know, time alone, or we see ourselves as a solopreneur or whatever, like you're not going to get there without, you know, help from so many people, even if it's, um, if it's not clear where that help's coming from, or you, you know, you mentioned mentorship and, um, I, I just think it's, it's really helpful to hear from someone like yourself who has, achieved it and specifically through the lens of the Oscars, like it's, you know, best director, uh, you know, like the, 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 the doc of the year, like these are, these are things that are people perceive as this solo journey with a backpack walking into the woods. But I think you'd be the first to say that it's, it's anything, but so to hear from your own mouth that, that, at the Oscars, that was the thing you were reflecting on the most. Um, how, let me ask another follow-up question there. So how, you know, what, what's some advice that you would give to people who now that you've, you know, laid bare this truth that you, you only get there on the shoulders of so many other people and peers and friends and mentors and collaborators, um, you know, do you have some advice uh, on how to show up? I mean, it's hard sometimes I'm like, my, my advice is, oh, it seems really harsh. <laughs> no, this is what, but let's see, this is, I, I'll make it harsh. Lot. I've been thinking about this a lot because just with social media and with where the world is at right now, um, and culturally, you know, I, and, and maybe people have been saying this for generations, probably. Um, but I've, I've had a lot of conversations with up and coming filmmakers and photographers, um, and, and they all come from it with different views and intentions. Um, 
you know, but it's sometimes I feel like the people are thinking about it a little bit backwards. It's like they want to get to this point for recognition or for more followers or for more, um, like we talked about earlier, like more external validation, reasons of external validation, which if is, is natural, I think. Um, but I don't know if that, that's the right paradigm to follow um, because of what we talked about earlier, because it, it, it has to be about the work. It's gotta yeah. be about, it's not like you're doing it to get to here. It's, it's, you're doing it to be here present now and, and doing the thing that like is, is inspiring to you that you're obsessed with and motivated by and that you're creating. Um, because only if you can do that, are you truly ever going to be able to get to there? And, and, and so to, to, to not, to maybe flip that around and, and think about it in that way, because, um, and this actually leads back to mentorship is that when I see people who are working in that way that I was just talking about, because a, a huge part of what I do in storytelling and in the filmmaking that I do is you, you're like really examining people's intentions, right? And what are their motivations? Um, and that's important. And those are questions that you should ask, ask yourself. Um, and so it, when, and I, and I think that that's, that's why I had really incredible mentors because I think that they saw that I was just obsessed with, you know, this thing that I was doing and making and creating. And the last thing I was really thinking about was, you know, trying to be famous or trying well, we didn't have social media in the late nineties, but, um, it, it, it was just what I was creating was like the most important thing and the people I was with and how we we're collaborating and making these things was like hugely, you know, um, interesting and to me. Um, and so that's a long way of saying, I don't know, find your passion. And, and, and no, it, but it's so, there's so much wisdom in there because again, this external part is, that's the part that people see at the end of the journey. And again, we're social animals. So being patted on the back, it's not, it's not a surprise that people want to be yeah. patted on the back. It's just the way you get back paths. It's not actually from just showing up on the summit. It's, you know what I mean? If you just, if you could took a helicopter to the summit, it's not about being at the summit, right? It's about the journey that it took you to get there and the people and your peers and your community is sort of along for the ride in so many ways. So I think that's, it's insane advice and it's, it's, it's not said frequently enough. So thanks for being willing to say it. Um, now let's talk about some of that success because clearly, um, you've seen a lot of it, especially recently. Do you have a, um, is there, um, I don't know, have you reconciled that yet? Is it like, has it sunk in? <laughs> I know you got, you, know, you have the tree, you have the trophies on the shelf there, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say, well, it, it, it was, first of all, like releasing a film and then, and then going into an Oscar campaign. I, I don't know if people really know, but it, it's, it's, it's insane. Um, and I'm not even doing like a $200 million feature film press tour. Like I'm doing a small doc press tour, but you're, you're in a whirlwind for a year. Um, and you're traveling a lot and you're doing a lot of events and you're meeting a lot of people. Um, and it took me a little bit to get my head wrapped around it because you're doing all these events because you're trying to get people to watch your film or get people to vote for your film, um, which is kind of antithetical to like what we were just talking about. You know, it's kind of like I'm out here on the road um, publicizing the work and not doing the work and trying to win something, but not doing the work. Um, but it was interesting because I just basically took the ethos of like doing work. Well, I was like, well, this is what I'm doing now. So 
I'm just going to do the best that I can in on this part of the journey for what it is. Um, and that's kind of what we locked into. We were like, okay, well, we're going to do what we do with our work to campaigning for the theatrical release and the Oscars. And so that that is how I, I got through it. Um, but, and this is probably easier to say if you've won it, won an Oscar, but, you know, it really reinforced for me exactly what we were talking about earlier, which is that, you know, like, because I made the decisions I made to do the things that I love, like, those are still truly what, at the heart of the matter, are the most important things to me. My family, my friends, um, the simple act of walking up a mountain, paddling out in, you know, in swell or in surf, um, skiing, like those things that were there for me in the beginning that inspired me. It's like, it, it's that whole experience reinvigorated my motivation to the things that have been always true to me. Um, because I realized like, those are like the only real true things that I have. And so, um, that's kind of how I've reconciled it. Uh, occasionally I definitely still think like, I, did that, did that really happen? Win an Oscar? <laughs> that's crazy. Like that is like the most absurd thought. And I'll pat myself on the back for a moment, but like I'll be like, wow, that, that was pretty cool. But um, in general, it's kind of like you're still the same person you were before you won the Oscar and um, keeping your feet on the ground and doing these things is still um, like the greatest joy of my life and my kids, you know? You, yeah, you, you mentioned this a couple times. Uh, I want to focus on two things. You talk about motivation and you know, what what makes you do the things you do. And um, you, you mentioned family a bunch. Um, I want to talk about two things. We'll talk about family first, and then I'm going to shift gears to talk about something else. So um, you co-directed the film with your wife, so there's family there. And I know um, you have uh, a couple kids. And, and how, what role does... The, the role of your family play in your your outlook on life and your career and how is it to work as closely I share this with I, I work very closely with my wife for whatever yeah. 15 or 20 years and we have a lot of mutual friends and and you know that uh, I'm curious what your take is on working closely with Chai who um, I'm also incredibly visionary in her craft um, so can you talk about you know the role of, of family your kids the way that you uh, work closely with Chai and and um, how that's impacted your, your career. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, first of all, that's funny. I'll just, I just have to throw this anecdote in there. Um, people ask about what the hardest part about filming Free Solo was. And so when we started production on Free Solo, Chai was um, six months pregnant and we had a two-year-old daughter Marina and my son James was born a couple months into production so we had a two and a half year old and a newborn on location in Yosemite um, doing the production of Free Solo it was insane <laughs> 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 like trying to do like managing like our crew the high angle team doing a 15 hour day and coming back and, and like changing diapers and watching dailies and like juggling but um my kids grew up with you know uncle alex and um my whole crew of you know burly climbing cinematographers and um and i and i and i now look upon that time you know um, and, and love thinking about it, but, uh, yeah, it's all mixed up. Right. Cause you know, this is Chai's like the mother of my children. She's, you know, my cohort in this film and producer and director and, and, um, and that can be really challenging as I'm sure you <laughs> have, have experienced, uh, 
especially when you have two directors in the house. Like, who gets to decide what you're going to eat for breakfast? <laughs> and two, <laughs> it's like we're both very kind of like strong-minded and opinionated, um, and have our ideas of how things are supposed to be done. But we very, very quickly realized on our first collaboration on Meru that the the, the two very different worlds colliding, which was me climbing bum, dirtbag, ski bum, adventure photographer guy, and then <laughs> very, very highly intelligent, sharp um, woman that's, you know, grown up in Manhattan and has, you know, never ever even thought about climbing. Um, but also like an incredible filmmaker and, and, and her story about her filmmaking career is actually probably worth doing a show on too because her career is extraordinary. She made her first film when she was 22. Um, first feature doc at 22. And cause she, she was breezing through Princeton. She was so bored she decided to make a film her senior year. <laughs> and she, she uh, got accepted into Tribeca Film Festival, her first feature doc at 22. And then it won best documentary at Tribeca, you know, when she's like 22 or 23. Pretty unheard of. I think still probably the youngest person to ever win a best feature doc at Tribeca. Um, anyway, so she, we kind of came together and it was that um, cross pollination thing that happened where a sensibility and a way of thinking meshed together with where I was coming from. And I think it birthed something that was different than um, either of us could have achieved on our own. And, and we recognized that. Like, and, and that's the kind of work that we look for. We're like, what are the projects that are really interesting to me and really interesting to her. Like if it, if it doesn't interest both of us, we're kind of setting them aside. We're working on projects that like we both are like, whoa, I really love it for this reason. And she really loves it for this reason. And then we kind of mesh it together. But well, I, it's inspiring and motivating and uh, reinforces the point about collaboration and community, whether that community is your wife or partner or, um, you know, uh, one of your other co-conspirators. It's just, it's really inspirational how you've connected this yin and yang. And I think that's, that's you know, it's a really common trait among people I've had on the show and, and for creators. So again, so many people think of this as a solo journey and to be able to join forces with people who are, you know, as or more talented than you and as or more experienced and, and in different areas or areas where your strengths and weaknesses are, are well matched. I think it's just, it sounds like it's been a really key piece of your journey with mentors and with partners and, um, uh, the other side, the less pretty side of a similar coin, um, I'll file it under motivation or focus or inspiration. Um, you and I have both been caught in really bad avalanches. And for me, it was a really, it was a huge turning point because it made me change uh, a lens that I had on, on this one precious life that we have. And um, I know yours is, was, was chronicled um, in, you know, uh, in lots of different places, but I haven't heard you talk about it specifically as a motivator or a deterrent or, you know, what, what lens did that have on your, you know, this, the, you could file it all under just um, curveballs or things that are hard. Like how did that help shape you as the person you are? Yeah, well, I'm sure through your experience, you had the, the probably very similar um, experience. Like you said, it, it it's a very heavy kind of check-in, right? Mm. Uh, a lot of the hard questions we avoid asking ourselves um, or questions that you don't even think about asking yourselves are, are answered <laughs> in a way without you wanting them necessarily to be answered or like, I mean, I guess we're all searching for, for purpose and meaning in life, but um, but it was a, a pretty significant deep check-in. Um, when I 
and it was pretty profound. It, 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 there was a moment probably within half an hour of it happening and me like surviving it being like, it's a, we have these amorphous kind of priorities floating around. They're kind of shifting, you know, sometimes they go here and sometimes they go here. Um, and I kind of remember it being like a, watching a screen and seeing things just go, you know, like slotting into all the places. And I was like, wow. Um, you know, like family, friends, um, you know, the importance of, of what you want to achieve in your life and what you, where you want to be and where you want to go and how you want to feel, how you want to, um, the things you want to see and experience, you know, it, it really made me check in about those things. Um, and what I got out of it at the time was that I felt like in some ways it, it reinforced what I'd been doing because um, it wasn't like I survived the avalanche and thought I should be doing something totally different. You know, I should have become a lawyer and I'm going to go to law school um, or I should have become a doctor. And, I, you know, it's not like in some ways it reinforced like, okay, you did pick the right path, even though, if, you know, it took, it took me several months to even think about going back in the mountains, but um, I did feel reinvigorated after I kind of got over the initial, you know, PTSD or whatever, you know, I was like, I was in shock for a little bit. Um, and, uh, but I did, and, I, and during that time, I was questioning what I was doing. I was like, well, is, is this the right thing? And, and I came out of it being like, yeah, this is the right thing. And actually, that, that was the spring before I went back to Meru the second time in 2011. And, you know, obviously, we, we climbed the shark's fin, and then I made the film that next year. So... Yeah, I think it's... Is it like focus? Was it just like... Focus. Yeah. 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 It kind of sheds some of the things that weren't that important. You know, like when you when you do that kind of deep dive check-in with yourself, the priorities line up, but it's also, I'm sure you know this as well as anybody, it's what you start to say no to. Yeah. Yeah. It's the shedding as well. It's, 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 I think it's hard for a lot of people to understand that level of focus that what it was required to get to, um, the level that you, Jimmy have, have reached, um, anything, any regrets along the way for the focus that you've had and the, the, you know, it's to say that it's 10,000 hours would be about a 30,000 hour understatement <laughs> to get, to get to where you're at or, or, uh, similar um any regrets along the way i think you know i'm i'm obsessed with this idea of the number one regret of the the dying is that they didn't live their life in accordance with their own values that they were you know go back to this is like a full circle moment here go back to how we open the show which is like all these cultural pressures what we should be and do and become and you, know, you should pre please your parents and your career counselor and your teachers and your grandma um but you know, you've debunked that. And so now I'm kind of checking in any, any regrets along the way, or, you know, if so, what well, are they? it's, I'm, I, I would say that right now, um, 